Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. This is episode number 72. What the heck? There's no release today. So today we're going to talk to Pete instead. Hey guys. And as usual, we have Phil. Hey Phil. Hey Ron, how's it going? As you couldn't tell, we've got another uh, New Zealander on the podcast today. Yep, Kiwi. That's right, that's right. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nebukasa. Easily and securely access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that also supports the Home Assistant project. Configuration is via the user interface, so no fiddling with router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. Kind of as we talked about, there's there's no release today. So 0.115 is delayed. We'll get back to that, I guess, when when the Home Assistant cycles back up when uh, 0.115 lands. Yeah, we'll follow the release schedule and as well as we usually will. Whenever, but I'm guessing that's going to change now if they've pushed the release back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there's still a ton of stuff going on uh, Home Assistant-wise. It's, uh, if you didn't catch it, they announced the month of what the heck. So essentially what that's about is you take your feature requests, things like that. And instead of you having to put it into GitHub or into somewhere else, basically there's a separate thread for it now. And there's a ton of people in there also voting on voting on different uh, features and things like that and kind of going, hey, me too. I've also got that issue or I've also seen this and you know, I want whatever or hey, I'd really love to have this one integration in and so on and so forth. So check that out. That's on the, that's on the community forums. Very well timed, especially for uh, Hacktoberfest coming up soon. Yeah, yeah. So it is. It is really well, uh, well timed. So I mean, I I don't know how much of uh, Hacktoberfest is gonna actually happen, just because I think I think you know there there have been a lot of feature requests and stuff coming in, anyways. So I think I think this is kind of still that fire hose for the mm. for the for the dev teams, <laughs> which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? So. You know, there, there's some there's some really good examples of why the heck or what the heck posts on uh, on the community already. I really like uh, so. There's been some great ones. So, why the heck can't we have automations and groups in subfolders? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, uh, when I first moved to packages, one of the first things I did was starting to organize, you know, things into rooms and in folders. And then I got really frustrated when that didn't work, and I had to move everything back out of the folders. I was Quite annoyed at that one. So if that can happen, uh, I've got I think I've got mine in folders, um, Phil. I don't know how I've done it, but I've got a packages <sighs> folder, and then I've got under the packages folder, I've got devices, climate, notifiers, and you know what? Maybe it was even before packages. But I remember I I did do subfolders for something, and it didn't work, and I was really frustrated. And what I really struggled to understand was the. You know how you've got the different uh, merging of folders, you know, like one's directory merge list, mm-hmm. another's directory yep. merge named or something like that. It never made, I just, I am constantly just guessing which one works yep. for me. So most of that's just over my head. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that was well explained, but. Yeah, whatever I'm doing now, it's working. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I'm, I think you've got your code up on GitHub, don't you, Pete? No, that's beyond me, unfortunately. <sighs> it's something I'd love to do, but uh, someone's going to have to give me some help with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but another thing that I also find frustrating is when you put, like, local file, like if you want to have images or anything in your Lovelace cards, you've got, like, that config www folder, but then when you want to view it, through the web browser, you have to use the local subdirectory. That doesn't make any sense to me. I agree with that. Um, and why the heck don't we have global variables? That is something that I would love to see in Home Assistant. Uh, Rohan, I don't know about you, but yep. I do a lot of templating, uh, a lot of um, setting things based on random. You know, if I can set a variable once and have it as a random value and then reference that elsewhere, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, totally agreed. I think I think those are those are some huge things. I think even even again, like you said, I uh, same. I'm I'm affected by exactly those, and I I agree with exactly those. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I th- I think I think both of us, Phil. I think both of our favorites are by far. Uh, and and this is actually a submitted. Uh, what the heck or why the heck is why the heck is Frank's profile picture so intimidating? <laughs> uh, which which uh, I I love that one so. I also loved that he changed it to a, a mock of the, the Joker from Batman. 
<laughs> did he? I didn't notice that one yet. Yeah, he, he, I don't know if it's still there, but that he did that uh, when, when that got posted. So good on him. <laughs> that's that's pretty funny. All right, some new Android app features are coming out, and I'm hoping this is going to make you jealous or hard because there's some cool ones in here. Uh, the first one to be added is the activity sensor, and I know this is available for iPhone, but you can do things now so your phone can tell Home Assistant what you're doing. Are you driving a car? Are you riding a bike? Are you walking, etc. cetera? Hmm, that's interesting. There's, mm. there's a lot of stuff you can do, like, hey, I'm riding a bike and I'm headed towards the house. So exactly, based on yeah. that, you know, I'll probably be a little longer than the, you know, t- if it takes me two minutes to the drive. General commit. Yeah, if you're driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's neat. Because I know that's available uh, in iOS. So that's good to see um, Android. I, 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 I don't know if the specific activity is available. Maybe, maybe it is. I haven't I haven't looked into that. But, but mm, I, I know yeah. I know it uses your motion and fitness so that it can track the direction and how fast you're yeah. going. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know if it makes a direct inference of, hey, you're going this slow, so you must be walking. Or you must be riding a bike. I mean, I, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it does or not. I'm, saying I, I'm not aware. Yeah. So for iOS, it's the current activity type as computed by iOS requires motion permissions to be enabled. And then it will give you uh, the confidence and the type of activity you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's so, basically whatever Apple Health yeah, exactly. thinks you're doing, which yeah. may or may not be accurate. <laughs> Um, other activity, uh, sorry, other sensors that you can see in Android now, including your Bluetooth status, if yeah. your phone's in do not disturb mode, whether the flashlight is on, uh, the next alarm, number of steps you've taken, the amount of storage left on your phone. Uh, but one thing I, I do like to see is, is the phone status. And I'm, I'm guessing if your phone starts ringing, uh, and I haven't tested this out, but that's one of the great automations I love about Android. And I doubt you'll be able to get this in iOS. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Apple are being more lenient now but being able to see you know that your phone is ringing and who's calling you uh if that's possible that's really cool so then you can have an announcement you yeah your phone on charger in the bedroom and you're in another room that you know your phone's ringing and, and this person's calling you so that's really great to see that would be very cool or if i can see like hey phil is calling on my tv or something like that yeah, based, exactly based yeah. on an automation i think i think there there can be some really neat things there yep Particularly, uh, especially when you think about from our last episode with uh, Keith, who was uh, a blind user of, of Home Assistant, and there's a lot of applications for that for you know someone that might be blind and they're or they're deaf. Maybe they're deaf and their phone's ringing, you know, and they're watching TV or with subtitles, and they can have a little message pop up or the lights can flash when yeah. their phone starts ringing. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Again, if you're hard of seeing, you're hard of hearing, hard like like any, anything like that, right? I think I think there can be a lot of interesting things as well. Exactly. Uh, reading and writing NFC tags is now also supported in the app. So that's great. I know Android have had NFC for quite some time and I've, yeah. I was, I've got a whole bunch of NFC tags in my drawer just waiting to be stuck up somewhere and to do something. So now that you can write those tags directly from the Home Assistant app is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, what, are, what are some use cases you're thinking for that, Phil? So before I put a power monitor on my office desk, uh, I actually have a NFC tag stuck here. And the idea being that when I wanted to use the computer, I would just tap my phone on the little NFC tag. The phone would then ping Home Assistant to turn on the computer, basically set up the room for the computer mode. So, you know, don't allow the lights to turn off automatically, um, things like that. Interesting. Okay. So basically as an, an advanced switch, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So sort of room presence plus almost. But yeah. Like- but it's not it's not a passive it, you you have to interact with it yes exactly right um and something you know maybe uh, i know there's magic cards which are rfc tags not nfc where you can have an rfc id your tag reader and it will do things like uh if you scan a particular card it will then play music you could then do the same thing with nfc tags you know yep. put um some like a, a game or a movie uh put an nfc tag in there in their cover or in their box and then just put that against your phone and have home assistant detect okay phil wants to watch bad boys again here we go we'll put on netflix and away you go right yeah yeah there could there could also be some cool uh interesting uh use cases for around like let's say you have a child and you want to make sure you check something every hour for the child or yep. something like that right every time you do it just tap it and it resets a counter if you don't you maybe you have some kind of a tts announcement yeah, exactly. saying Hey, similar to um, how some 
security guards have to walk around yeah. and to determine that they've done their job properly and they've actually been to a place. They have to tap a yeah. their wristwatch or phone on an, a tag somewhere in the building that is that proves that they were at that place at that time so they can prove that they weren't just sitting in the office eating donuts all day. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so, which is... Yeah, I, I saw that feature in the app this morning after reading the release notes, so I ordered some NFC tags straight away. <laughs> I don't have any, so I'm, I'm going to stick them around the house for scene launches, so, you know... Yes, yeah. Might better use one in the car, so when I get in the car, I can actually um, swipe that and then get the house to do something based on the fact that I've just gotten my car. Actually, yeah, that's one of the first NFC tags I had. I, I put one, and I think it's still stuck in my on my dashboard in the car. And it does, I don't use it anymore because I've changed phones like so many times now. But my original use case for it was it that I would tap the NFC tag and it would turn Bluetooth on on my phone and open up uh, the navigation yeah. app on the phone so that, you know, and maybe start playing some music through the Bluetooth speakers, you know, just so I didn't have to tap it before getting straight into the car, right? Just tap the phone once and it opens up everything that I need to put the phone into driving. Yeah, I, I was actually looking at doing stuff like this a very long time ago with, uh, you know, that I was just playing around, just getting a device and, and doing exactly that with uh, with like a car kind of automation too, right? Um, yeah. Plus, it's, a, it's another kind of way of indicating to home assistant that, hey, maybe if, if you see this here, that means I am in the car, right? So based on that, do yep. whatever. That means you're not at home. You know, you're in the car yeah. somewhere. So Yeah, confirm driving. that I'm, again, maybe. if you're using the Bayesian sensor or something like that, that's another yep. data point for it to make saying you're not home, right? And of course, if you've got Tasker, then NFC tags are just another level of automation that you yeah. can do with an Android phone, you know, put a NFC tag by your bed when you tap your phone on the nightstand your phone goes into do not disturb mode and now home assistant can see that your phone's in do not disturb which means you're sleeping so now the house can go into sleep mode you know a whole bunch of possibilities yeah I actually wonder if there's because I use wireless chargers I wonder if uh, NFC kind of interferes with that in any way right because so like both both myself and my girlfriend both have iPhones so and we both have Mm -hmm. uh, wireless chargers for our iPhone like they're like little stand-up pedestal chargers Mm -hmm. So I wonder if I can just stick a NFC tag there and then based on, hey, great, girlfriend's is on there on her uh, charger, mine's on my charger, and based on that, maybe, you know, okay, great, that means you're both probably in bed or whatever, right? I think you'd want the, the tag to be separate yeah. from the charger, though, because the, the tag you only want to execute once, right? Otherwise, it's just going to be constantly binging at you that oh, you're near an NFC tag, you're near an NFC tag, you're near an NFC tag, right? Yeah, that's true. I actually, and yeah, that's a good point because I don't know how that the ch- charging state is actually already in the app. I use that for my breakfast automation mm. to turn on my coffee machine, so Home Assistant knows whether my yeah. phone is charging so, or so not. So the only thing is I, so to say I, I'm charging at this charger versus I'm charging at that charger because I, I like again, for example, if I have one here at my home uh, office, right? If I'm charging my phone there, yeah, uh, then. Oh. I've just got a condition yeah. around mine, so I make sure I go to bed late at night. It's always between, say, 10 p.m. Yeah. and 3 a.m., um, and I same routine. I turn the stair lights off every night. That's the last thing I do before I go to bed, and that's got a chalet in behind it, so I've got a wait template that says if someone turned off the hall lights, stair lights, in the last three minutes, and then my yeah. phone is charging between 10 a.m. Mm. and 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., then I right. must have gone that's to bed. Cool. So then shut everything down, and that's nice. actually working really well. That's a great use case for the weight template as well. Yeah. Mm. Just, yeah. It's, uh, that, that is actually really nice. I'm, st- I'm still old school. I still tell my Echo to go to sleep or good night, rather. And, yeah. Uh-huh. I, 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 yeah, I have a good night routine set up, which just yeah. pings a script in Home Assistant, right? It shuts everything down. Uh, all right, so Pete, let, let's we've got more time now to grill you, and I, I think yeah. you're someone that we need to spend more time with. So, first of all, your username is XBMC Nut. So, I have seen hey. your username everywhere on the internet, and I actually googled to make sure that I <laughs> have not just been making this up. So, I've seen you on the Vera forums, I've seen you on Synology forums, I've seen you on Open Alec or something yep. other Alec, which was a fork of. Uh, xbmc coding. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, you're yeah. obviously xbmc so you've probably been xbox media center since yep. when i started really using when. xbox yeah. media center back on the xbox version one i i was yes so my question is when are you going to stop stalking me like, <laughs> and 
because <laughs> you are just everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, I have been on the internet prior to the internet being e- existing before, before uh, dub 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 was even a thing. So um, I used to dial up, you know, to a university and wow. ke- connect out through CompuServe. You know, oh, it used wow. to cost me two dollars a two dollars a minute to be online. <laughs> So my, my cool. monthly so toll was horrendous. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah. I guess well, we are the Home Assistant Podcast. So let's first start how you're using Home Assistant or how long you've been using Home Assistant for. Um, I've got – I just had a look. I've actually got a backup um, that dates back to 26. So, um, But I got a feeling that I started using Home Assistant around about release 17. Wow, so okay. that, that's a, a long very time. long time ago. And I, I think it was probably through some YouTube videos that I, I saw that I was playing around with Open Hab, which I, I think what what everyone is a natural progression. Um, before I <laughs> pretty much pulled all my hair out and gave up on that. So um, yeah, I, d- I just couldn't get around the whole coding of that, and and yeah, it was just beyond me in the different um, interfaces. So yeah, tried Home Assistant on a Pi like everyone does, and. Mm. It immediately detected my TTS devices and, you know, a couple of things just popped in. I thought, geez, this is awesome. But then having to learn YAML was a very, very steep learning curve for me because I'm not yeah. a software guy. I'm not a coder. I'm a hardware guy. So, right. uh, But, yeah, I've got my, my head around that and I'm using VS Code now with the Home Assistant extension, which has got some linting in there and it just makes writing That's YAML yeah. so, so much easier. Yeah. That's I'm huge. Especially the entity ID completion. Oh, and 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 yeah. the i the icons. You know, you just start typing yeah. NDI and it'll start searching the icon library for you. So I, I just love it. I um I fought with VS Code for many many months, installed it, tried it, uninstalled it, put it back in again, and um yeah, now I'm using it religiously every day. Love it. Yeah, it's it's I'm I. I I love it too. It's, it's, it's funny because it was actually Frank after one of the episodes. He was like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, what do you use? I'm like, Adam. He's like, why would you use that? He's like, go switch to, switch to, switch to VS Code. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and I, and same thing after that, right? Because I was like, okay, this is just another editor. And then I found the, the different uh, plugins and stuff. And I was like, oh, wow. Extensions, yeah. This is a game changer. Yeah, once you put in... Once you put in a few key extensions, obviously the Home Assistant one's mandatory, but there's some others there to allow you to, to highlight the brackets, and I've just put in one that allows me to alphabetize my, my YAML so you can actually sort. If you've got a group and you've got a whole bunch of entities in there, you know, switches and, and lights and things, I'm a, I'm a stickler for law and order, so I like oh. those to be in alphabetical order. So you can just write cool. click, I hit F9, that will alphabetize them. So. That is <laughs> lazy. Yeah. Oh man, okay. I, I, okay. You gotta, you gotta send me whatever that is because I, I'm exactly that, but I never do it because I'm just, it's like, okay, I, I, I can't manage this. Yeah. Like, like it does bother me, but it's, it's, and the other thing is like spacing between like the different, like, you know, where you go from like entity to something else or something else. Yeah. And it's like, ah, yeah. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. And I just found one that if you type something, um, I think I added it in about a week ago. If you type something uh, that is words, you can case format it. So it's all lowercase and then stick an underscore in between the words oh, to make nice. it YAML compliant. So oh. yeah, you just highlight it and then yeah, you run, run that little, uh, um, code and it will put an underscore, join them all together with an underscore to make them compliant. That's really cool. One thing I find super helpful with VS Code is snippets as well. Like, so you have like an automate, like I have an automation snippet. It's basically yeah. just a template, right? Like I just type in automation and then I pre-fill. It pre-fills, fill you know, everything that I need. Yeah, and fill in yeah. the blanks, yeah. Yeah, and they recently added um, template tester thingy where you can right-click and actually run a template right in VS Code. So you, you can actually test, you can test a template, a, a Home Assistant template, right inside VS Code. Just right click oh, and run what? template and it'll run it right inside the code and show you the result. Okay. That's awesome. My my mind is literally blown. I feel like such a noob right now. My my mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean I'm are you guys are the coders. I'm not supposed to be telling you how to use VS Code. I'm a hardware guy. I, you can tell how often I code, man. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. 
But no, I use that all the time now. You put a template in, then right click on it and see what the output is in real time and go, oh, great, that's, that's awesome. working. You know? That's really nice. So you don't need to jump back to the Home Assistant template editor and do it there. You can do it straight in, in VS. So. That's wicked. Now I've lost my train of thought now. Where were we? And this, is, this has been the uh, <laughs> VS Code podcast. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. There's a, I did a, about a 15-minute video on YouTube um, a few weeks ago, which has got all of the um, extensions that okay. I use in VS Code. Uh, nice. We'll so link to that in the show notes for sure. Go, go and have a look at that because it's uh, – yeah, I, I, I often do these videos for myself mm-hmm. so that I can remember what I did and how to use it. <laughs> So you've got a, a reference point in the future. You future Pete comes and goes. How did I do it? Correct. That's how I. That's why I. That's why I started using YouTube is for myself. You know. Yep. Yeah. That's wicked. Yeah. Oh, I just found your YouTube channel. Yeah. So yeah, I've been using it a long time. Um. Yeah, and it, it, it's evolved and evolved and evolved, and now it's a big, yeah. scary, hairy thing. Um. That I'm struggling to keep on top of so um, my next big project is trying to look at what frank's done with his um uh, the way he structured all of his yaml and and redo it all but yeah i need a yeah. i need a level four lockdown to get that done <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come yeah, to Melbourne. yeah we've got that for you yeah yeah <laughs> well so so it, it actually doesn't take so I, I actually did exactly that right and uh, one day i was uh, browsing through frank's uh, github repo and I, I figured i was trying to find an example of something and i was like he probably has this and i looked through it and uh, and i was like wow i could actually find everything i was looking for in his config very easily and and i yep. guess just the way he has it organized is actually very logical to me um and and i did talk to him about this and, mm. and one of his feedback was look it, it, you got to do what works for you right like i mean some people they prefer one giant pane with like you know ten thousand lines in it and great i'll just control off my mm. way through it for me personally i my brain doesn't work that way so it it, it doesn't take too long Pete. It, it, it's actually it's actually pretty decent once you get a hang of a couple of them it's just uh it's just the migration path right? have because I don't have a, a dev system. It's all live and I rely, the whole house relies yeah. so much on Home Assistant now is that I, I can't really afford yeah, to break yeah. it. One thing, one thing I actually <laughs> did is I, uh, that I, it, so the reason I did it is actually exactly for this is uh, Circle CI. So I just use uh, basically Home Assistant's built in script checker. Uh, so when I push it up to, mm-hmm. uh, I use Bitbucket because before GitHub didn't have private repos for free or whatever for my for my home config, so I mm. pushed it up to there, and then Circle CI grabs it, and 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 a bunch of others do it too. You don't have to use Circle CI. Anymore. Yeah, you can probably use like Travis for Jenkins. Yeah, I, I tried a couple of them actually. I tried Sat Travis first, and Circle just I think I just it was more natural for me. So I was like, okay, great, here you go. Not that one is better than the other or anything like that. And I basically. Uh, get that to do my script check so that there's no uh, so before i actually do a git pull on my actual config it'll actually when i push it up it'll actually go in and, and i can have it on a separate dev branch and everything as well and then merge it all back in to come up one main thing if i need to now, you, you might as well be talking french to me there rohan <laughs> <laughs> Touche. But basically, basically it, it, it runs the script checker without you actually touching your production code right yeah uh which is uh which is handy so I need to look into that. Yeah, yeah. Well, couldn't you just hit the check config button before you hit restart on Home Assistant? You could, but the problem is, but now let's say you mess something up. You've already messed up your, your, your config and you have to change it back, right? Here, your running system is still your running system. And then this is just a separate thing. But yeah, you, you totally could do that. Right. You totally could do that. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the painful approach and do it Do it slowly. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah. But that's awesome. So, I mean, from, from you know, you, you've you've been using Home Assistant for a while now, um, you said, and, you know, what kind of uh, what kind of devices are you using? What kind of stuff do you like in terms of automation and stuff like that? I, I'll give you an overview of a hardware. I mean, I started on a, a Raspberry Pi, but I think after I'd burnt through about six SD cards yeah. um, and lost my entire configuration multiple mm. times and had to rebuild from the ground up. Yeah. Um, I just, I gave up on that. So I moved to a, an Intel NUC and, um, yeah, I've never looked back and, and I'm just on a mission to try and make that go faster and faster and faster. Yeah. So I sort of started out with a seller on NUC and then I saw an i3 cheap. So I bought that one and sold the other one. And then I saw a deal on an i5. So <laughs> the whole time 
I've been trying to make my history and logbook and home assistant like snappier. Yeah. So yep. I, I thought that, well, if I keep getting a faster processor and more RAM, so now I'm running an NVMe drive with 16 gigs of RAM on an i5, and then, but nothing would make my, my logbook go faster or my history. And then yeah, a couple of releases ago, Home Assistant do a major update, and next minute my, my history's like instant. I go, yeah. probably could have done that on a pie. <laughs> 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 Without spending all the money. That's right, that's right. Yeah. you, you got to love how for, for a free open source tool, how much money it actually goes into it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, don't get me started on my network. Um, but, yeah, so I've found I would definitely, if you were starting out with Home Assistant, de- you know, definitely start on a Pi, but I would migrate away from that as quickly as you could. Anything that's based around a micro SD card is just, yeah, especially when you've got database rights. Um, and the other mandatory for me is that, mm. that, that excellent Google Drive backup, yeah. um, which can take your snapshots and back them up in the cloud. That's just an absolute must-have. Um, I've used that so many times it's not funny. So I have a nightly backup and I think I keep 10, the 10 latest backups in the cloud. Um, and what I've done with that, I've, because you've only got 15 gigs of storage on Google Drive, I've separated my Home Assistant database into the add-on, uh, the MySQL mm. add-on. So it's not, it's not part of the main core. Yep. So that means I can choose a selective backup and choose to not back up the the database add-on. Okay. So that keeps my that keeps my backups in the cloud right. like about I think they're about seventy or eighty megabytes. But when I was including the database, they were over two gigs. So you know I filled up Google Drive in a week yeah. with yeah. with uh, with my with my backup. So yeah, I separated that out and it works for yeah. And depending on how many devices and stuff you have, the more you have, the more the recorder database just dies. It's it's funny. I actually spun up MySQL this morning <laughs> because I was not not running into the space issues. It was just I was running into recorder performance issues right where it was taking a while to boot and stuff and i'm like all right i'm done with this i'm just gonna punt it off to uh something external i I did a um i i did a uh a dive into the database found out how to do that with some software tools and looked at what was causing a lot of my Mm -hmm. issues um and and honed those out but yeah my database still blows out like gig and a half two gigs you know in in 30 days how long are you keeping the data for a month yeah, that would do it. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I keep mine. I think for like three yeah. days yeah. or two days or something like that. And- yeah, well, I've got I've got power. Um, I'm doing utility utility yeah. monitoring for calculating power costs and all that kind of stuff. So, have you thought about something external like Grafana yeah. and InfluxDB to do that sort of long term? Uh, I've statistics? looked I've looked at it, but I'm a, like, there's lots of things that you can add into Home Assistant, but they really you know there's some some great graphs and things out there but when am i ever going to use them you know every time i've made a graph i go man that looks cool and then i never look at it <laughs> yeah you know um, <laughs> so it would take me it'll be a, a weeks long program uh, project for me to build grafana yeah. and influx db it. and it, i'd be really happy with it at the end of it. i go man that looks awesome and then i'd go well when am i going to use it yeah, yeah. It, so, you, you know what? It's yeah. funny because I have a specific page with it's just all graphs and it's all from, you know, every sensor in the house that also measures temperature and stuff like that. The amount of t- I, times that I've looked at that has probably been twice, like ever. Yeah. Right? And, and it's just like, all right, cool. Yeah. But, so, yeah, we, we've got a tablet in the kitchen which has just got one um, Home Assistant tab on it with all the stuff that we care about in the house. So it's got the surveillance cameras, um, it's got a clock, it's got all the temperatures of all of the rooms, um, the status of the heat pumps, um, and then you've got the pool temperature, the spa temperature, outside temperature, yeah. you know, um, what time the next high tide is, just useful information. And it never changes. It just stays on that. Um, mm-hmm. Someone rings the doorbell, it changes to a tab, which has got a full screen view of one camera uh, using mm-hmm. browser mod, I think nice. I use for yeah. that. Yep. Um, and then after 30 seconds, it flipped back to the main tab again. And um, we use that tablet that's all awesome. the time, all the time. And what sort of tablet is it that's powering it? Uh, it's a Samsung Tab A, Android tablet running fully kiosk browser. Yep. Um, yep. I I have tried honestly every Home Assistant dashboard that's ever been made, and I've, 
I, I was all MQTT based and, and the trouble is you're reliant on the developer so much. Mm-hmm. You know, if they've got some feature you want and they don't have it and you pull your hair out and then I thought, you know, this is probably a couple of months ago, I thought, ah, oh, damn, I'm going to have to build this in Lovelace, you know. So I took a photo of my dashboard that I had that I liked the look of and I was like, right, I'm on a mission now to build this in Homeless. It took me two yeah. weeks and I've got, I was really, really reluctant to add custom components to Home Assistant um, and various integrations yeah. through hacks. But in the end, I thought, well, look, I can't do what I need to do unless I have some tweaks in there. So, um, and to be honest, it's, it's been yeah. awesome. Absolutely awesome, and um, yeah, it's it's working. Really, why, really uh, well. if you don't mind me asking, why the why the hesitation around adding the custom components? Is it is it the it can potentially break Chrome Assistant, or or is it just more work than you care to do, or like what is it? Oh, uh, my yeah, my OCD thing. I think I like everything yeah. nice and in order, and I didn't want anything to infect my nice <laughs> Home Assistant clean. You know, no no errors yeah, in yeah. my logs. <laughs> You know, so and Home Assistant has a a, a mandatory or a standard um, error log that yeah. comes up. You know, when you look, you are using yeah. you know custom components. Don't complain yeah. to yeah. us yeah. if anything breaks, kind of thing. You know, um, yeah, and I'm forever going through my logs and trying to clean up erroneous messages. You know, I don't like the fact that that's there, but the benefit I get from these integrations with hacks and the custom components is that that outweighs. Um, Anyway, totally, well, there's totally. no downsides, basically. Um, yeah, it just really, really enhances um, and the whole system and allows me to do what I want to do. So, yeah, see, ask me about my automations. I've got, I've got my top thirteen here. So, <laughs> yeah, your top thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, please. Well, there's no release today, so go, go for it. <laughs> thirteen. Why thirteen? Why, why not? Why not fifteen or? Oh, uh, well, I had, I had, no, well, I had my top 10, but then I found, yeah, yeah found three more. So, um, okay, I love it. All right. What, I found a blog post that someone automated their pool controller. So I yeah. got a swimming pool with just a manual pool timer on it. So that's the first thing I did. I've been in this new house about two and a half, three years now, and um, it had nothing, didn't even have a sensor light, not, not one sensor light. So I've been, trying to automate the whole house yeah. and it's taken me three and a half years to get to where I am. But the pool was the first thing I did. So um, I put a, uh, a song off down there just so I could turn the pool pump on and off. And then I added a temperature sensor so I could, you know, tell how uh, warm the pool was. And I send that to the display and we use that all the time. And you can ask um, the lady whose name shall remain nameless um, <laughs> what the pool temperature is and she'll tell you you know, how cold or how warm the pool is. Um, and now wow. I'm on a um, <clears throat> I'm on a mod. I'm adding three uh, non-contact liquid level sensors. I don't know whether you've ever seen those. I just bought them off AliExpress a month ones. or so ago. Okay. They're freaking awesome. They go on the outside of the of a, a liquid, so you yeah. have like a, a glass Definitely. bottle or a plastic bottle. Yeah. And it's powered by 5 volts and... When it comes in contact with the water, an LED comes on and it sends a low-level pulse back to a controller. So I'm putting three of those on the outside of my pool um, drain thing where the water goes down yep. into the pool pump. I can't remember what it's called. Um, so I'm going to have one at normal water level and then one at when, the, when it's been raining and the water's too high and then one when the water's too low. So that's going – so what I'm going to do, in the winter I turn my pool pump off and I yep. put the um, the filter onto waste, and then at the moment it's offline. So after, when it's been raining, I've got to go down and turn the pool pump on right. for 20 minutes to drain the water out. But, of course, sure. with these liquid level sensors on the outside, Home Assistant is going to automatically know that the pool level is too high and it's going to automatically drain it for me and take it down to the normal level without me having to do anything. That's amazing. Yeah. So that if yeah, we'll have to put a link to those contact sensors in the show notes because they sound amazing. Yeah. Well, I used um, I drilled holes in the filler box yeah. and put in um, mm-hmm. floats. But the trouble is, yep. is when the when the pool pumps on, the water will will pools 
down the drain and the float sensors do uh, this. Of course. Yeah. So yeah. Home, assistant, home assistant is going high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. They, they yeah. move up and down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So does it just, does it just use like ultrasound or something like that? Like, or maybe not ultrasound, but like some kind of RF. I don't know how they work, but it works very, very well. So I did the same. So are you going to connect those two? Like a like a node MCU or something, and then push it over to home with MQTT. Yeah, what I've got my pull controller is actually in front of me. I've got a big, um, big weatherproof container, so it's got my pull LEDs in it. So I put two five meter mm-hmm. RGB strips down each side underneath the pull. So there's a a Tasmoda H801 controlling those, and then I've got a Sonoff power which does the pull control for the pump, so that I can measure the current drain for my template switch so I know whether the pool pump's running or not and can count how many hours it's been on. Yep. So <clears throat> I've switched over to a, a new power company that does offline, uh, okay. yeah, off-peak power. So mm-hmm. um, my pool pump used to run from uh, 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock at night, uh, seven days a week. But with the new mm-hmm. power company I've got, the peak power rate is from 7 a.m. until 11 a.m. and then again from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. So what I've done with Home Assistant is I've told it those times and my pull pump now switches on outside of those times and it just counts uh, and runs for right. eight hours every day but never in peak power time. Ah, uh, that's right. My yeah. pull pump uses like 600 watts so it's quite thirsty. And yep. I've done the same thing with a, my hot water cylinder. So I put a solid state relay on the heater element and then I use a Shelly device to turn that solid state relay on and so my hot water turns off at 7 in the morning and turns back on again at 11 a.m. Nice. So my hot water cylinder is not heating during peak power time. And... Yeah, three of us can have a shower at nine okay. o'clock in the morning, even though the hot water cylinder has been off for two hours. Mm. Mm. So, and that's saving me about six hundred dollars wow. a year. That is significant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's well, that's a money well, yep. well saved, I guess. So I've added, I've done the same with the spa pool. What I did with the spa pool is there's an old fifteen year old spa pool outside, and I hacked that. So I took the controller apart, and there's a copper, um, a big copper strip between mm. the, the the controller motherboard and the, the three kilowatt heater element. So I took that off. I unbolted that copper strip, and I put a um a, a real heavy duty contactor relay contactor in there, mm-hmm. and then I control that with a Shelly device as well so my pull pump my spa controller turns the heater element on but home assistant doesn't let it turn on if it's between 7 a.m and 11 a.m mm, and again right. again at night between 5 right, a.m right. and 9 p.m so my spa pool can never heat during peak power rates so i do that with the spa pool the swimming pool and the hot water cylinder and as i say that's adding up to just over 600 dollars a year so wow far. Wow. And you know, I couldn't do that with, without Home Assistant because there's just too much going on. Yeah. See, see, you paid for all your nooks and stuff right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, big time. Big time. And then I had the other trouble with the spa pool was the kids would get in, my son would get in with his mates, and it's a really old one. And the controller for it, when you push buttons to turn the pump and that on, but if you push a sequence of buttons, it goes into programming mode oh. and you can actually oh. put it into the wrong mode where it goes into standby and it doesn't heat anymore. So then the, the, you go out to use the spa and the water's cold because it, <laughs> you know, it hasn't been. So what I did is I drilled a hole in the side of the spa pool and put a thermal well in there and then put a, um, a waterproof temperature sensor and then connected it to a modified sonoff and i send that back to home assistant i've got an automation that runs if the temperature drops below 37 degrees then i get a voice announcement throughout the whole house hey the spa pool temperature is dropping there must be something wrong so i can go out there and check to see if anyone's fiddled with the controller your house must be like wallace and gromit like yeah. you just <laughs> so yeah every everything's everything's automated so i even um I even automated my soldering iron in my office because <laughs> I keep leaving it on all the time. Nice. So, oh, that's the worst, yeah. So, yeah, now I've got an Amazon dot which tells me every five minutes that I've left the soldering iron <laughs> on and if I've left it on for more than 30 minutes, it turns it off automatically. Nice. And I've, yep. I've just done that with a yep. Xiaomi Zigbee plug which monitors the power consumption so it yeah. knows that the power's on. Are you using the Amazon Echo media player component to do the notifications on the Echo dot? Yes. 
Uh, well, I'm, I've got six um, G speakers and three mm -hmm. Echo Dot. So I've got nine cool. TTS speakers in the house. And yeah, yep. I used a media player to get those to speak and then just a standard TTS for the others. And we use speech all the time. So, yeah, every time the house farts, um, she, uh, Mrs. G says something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so, and on. so I've got fire alarm automation as well. I've got six smoke alarms in the house, and I run. I, I did a pretty extensive automation that can actually yep. – we've got two exits in the house, so the, mm -hmm. the main front door and then another door out by the pool. So the – automation actually looks at what smoke detector went off and then mrs g will actually tell you which smoke detector is an alarm and tell you which door to exit okay based on that zone ah, so like they do cool. like they do my yeah, backgrounds yeah, yeah. in the security industry so that's what a professional fire alarm system will do so mm -hmm. i have uh, i have lights flash red i have a siren going and then i have a, a message on repeat until you stop it to tell you what door to exit yeah, yeah. to, uh, yeah, to exit smart. from for, for me i would never be able to cook if that was the case <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't, don't put a smoke alarm. Get out, get don't out. Put a yeah, smoke yeah. alarm in your kitchen. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Rohan's cooking. Get out. Don't eat it. Yeah. yeah, you may not want to eat this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And one of my um, one of my sillier uh, automations is I've actually got a um, a pan talk zoom camera on my deck, and I've got a view of the ocean from the house. And we get we, oh, we face towards the sunset, so we actually get some pretty awesome sunsets. But at times we're inside watching TV, and we don't bother to look out the window to see what the sunset's like. So I've got an automation that when sunset or a couple of minutes before the sun is setting, it turns the pan tilt zoom camera towards the sunset, takes a snapshot, checks to see if my oh. TV is on. And then if it's on, it sends an image in the bottom corner of the screen that says, "Have you checked the sunset today?" And there's a picture of the <laughs> picture of the sunset there. That's kind and of it nice. only works in yeah, it only works in summer. So yeah, I've got a season yeah. sensor in there. So if it's summer, and yeah, we're going to get a sunset, it reminds us to look outside and be in the moment. That's <laughs> nice. That's really nice. You know what yeah. that. That's actually a really unique yeah. and cool use for it. Like it's not making your life any easier, but it's allowing you to just stop for a minute and enjoy like the the fun, like the yes. small moments in life that you might get to miss, usually miss out on. Yeah, oh, my wife just started laughing when she saw that pop up on the TV. She, <laughs> she thought, <laughs> "What next?" That's right. So, what TV are you using to be able to get that message to pop up? Um, I'm new, I've got an Android TV, and there's a, a an Android app for that. I think it's called Pip Up. Um, okay, and you can use a, a REST uh, to send uh, Home Assistant uh, notifications cool. uh, and even video. So I have a pop up when someone pushes the doorbell. If the TV in the lounge is on, then whoever's at the door pops up in the bottom corner of the TV. Right, mm. that's so, cool. Yeah, it's, it runs a um, uh, uh, an HTTP server uh, on yeah. the TV, so you can send um, send info to it, and that works really well. Um, so I also use that little pan talk zoom camera to if anyone opens a gate on the property. So what mm -hmm. I did is I IP65 a bunch of Xiaomi uh, Zigbee door sensors so I, I put those into ip65 boxes and we've got four gates around the property and <clears throat> two of the gates can be seen by the ptz and i've also got a spotlight outside so if anyone opens the two gates that can be seen by the ptz then the camera turns towards the gate and if it's at night then the spotlight comes on and mrs g mm. also announces if any of the gates open so if someone comes through the pool gate then you get an announcement the pool gate just opens that's that that's really handy really cool and these boxes are they just like can you open them to then replace the battery in yeah the yeah Xiaomi four screws and, and you pull them out they take a little bit of maintenance the batteries are lasting about six or seven months but okay what i'm finding with the batteries and those xiaomi sensors i'm going to build a, a home automation sensor that can detect this the the battery level will just be constant the whole time like 90 percent 90 percent and then like the battery five. goes crazy it'll go it'll no it goes yeah. it, it'll go 80 90 70 90 and in, in a space <laughs> yeah. of 48 hours and then it'll just die so you actually get an indication i've i've graphed it all and i've seen this behavior on multiple mm. occasions so 
I'm going to build a sensor that can detect when the battery's going loop de loop, and then it'll, yep. I'll need to get out there and replace yeah, yeah. it before it dies. Yeah, that's, that's right. The official term, by the way, loop de loop. Loop de loop. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to yeah. make yeah. a home assistant loop de loop detector. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. I've I've got a bunch of spare Xiaomi sensors, so I'd be interested to put them outside. But yeah. obviously, they're not waterproof. So yeah, no. I, well, I did a video on that too, so that's on my channel. You oh, can find that how I made that. Um, and the, the range on those is amazing. I've got half a dozen um, uh, Xiaomi um, power switches, you know, smart the plugs. plugs. Yeah, smart yep. plugs. And, that, of course, they act as repeaters all around the house. So from my Conby 2, which is in my garage, to my furthest gate is probably 150 feet, mm -hmm. 50 metres, mm -hmm. 55 metres, and it works flawlessly. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. I never yeah. had any issue with it. Wow, that's cool. Um, did you want to... Did you want to talk about my coffee machine, Phil? We started uh, yeah, the conversation I, 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 I do because I missed it. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> as I said, Pete, we, you'd, I was rechecking just how much you have been stalking me on the internet, and I, I, I googled your username, and I found your little. You had a one of those instructables somewhere on how to hack one of these Breville coffee machines, and sure enough, me and my wife have the exact same model. Yeah, same. I was like, this guy cannot get any more store pressure. Right? Right. Like he's just watching what I'm buying now and then hacking it before I get to it. That's right. What a what a creep. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> same thing. I have the exact same machine, so I am very curious. <laughs> yeah, well the reason why I did that is Shelly actually had a competition to see who could come up with the craziest idea for using a Shelly, you know, Wi Fi nice. um smart switch. And I'd already um, done a video, I put a Shelly inside an outdoor motion detector. So uh, there's just enough room in an, an outdoor PIR, which is mains mm -hmm. power to turn on your outdoor lighting. There's actually just enough room to squeeze a Shelly in there. And the nice thing about that is you can turn a mains powered outdoor motion sensor into a home assistant sensor with a Shelly in it because you can detach in the Shelly software, you can detach the switch right. from the relay. So when the when the motion sensor goes off, you can get the Shelly to detect that as a switch input, mm -hmm. send that to Home Assistant, and then Home Assistant can in turn turn the light on, activate the Shelly relay if it's dark. But the beauty about that is that you can use the motion sensor for outdoor presence right. detection at all other times. So if someone steps onto your property, you've now got a smart outdoor PIR. So the point I suppose I was getting to is I couldn't use that for my hack, you know, my hack thing because I'd already yeah. done that. So I thought... What can I do with a Shelly that no one's ever done before? And I thought, I know, I'll, put, I'll make my coffee machine smart. It's something I've always wanted to do. So, um, and yeah, it actually wasn't that difficult. So I put a Shelly inside. Um, you need to use a Shelly one because okay. that's the only one that's got clean contacts. Mm -hmm. um, no power on the contacts. Don't use any other device, otherwise your smoke will come out of your coffee machine. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no one likes a smoked coffee. Oh. No, no, everything runs on smoke. Everyone knows that. And when you let it out, it stops working. So, um, yeah, use a Shelly one and then you can just parallel that across the toggle button to turn the machine on. And then, uh, to make it, I haven't actually updated the, um, uh, the, the blog post yet, but then what I've, I've done is I've made a template now a template switch and I've used a Xiaomi plug monitoring the power for the coffee machine. Nice. So I now know whether the using the template switch whether the coffee machine is on or not. So <clears throat> and then I just added a script um to toggle that button and then when I can just say to Mrs. G now, I feel like coffee and like it's the coolest party trick, you know. <laughs> People see my tablet on the wall um, and they love what I've done there. But when they come in, I just say to Mrs. G, I feel like coffee. And then they're all looking at me because nothing happens for about five seconds. Yep, and then the next minute, up. my Breville coffee maker turns on. <laughs> that guy, yeah. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. But what I do with the Android app is that uh, when I'm in bed in the morning, I, my morning routine is to unplug my phone and sure. then check 
blog posts and you know release notes I'm a, I'm a stickler for release notes so I do that in the morning and as soon as I unplug my phone home assistant detects that I'm now discharging and turns on the coffee machine yeah so and then by the time I get out of bed and do my routine it's been half an hour before I get up to the kitchen to you know and make the coffee the machine's coffee. on nice and warmed up for yeah, you yeah and it's nice yeah. and warmed up yeah yeah so that's working well that's brilliant. So, yeah, I will update those notes. So, yeah, that's about it. I mean, I've got the all your standard, every cupboard, every garage, every nook and cranny has got a <laughs> yeah. Xiaomi uh, motion sensor in it. Yeah. So yep. when you go and the light comes on automatically. Um, but the, I suppose the problem these days is with the prolif- proliferation of these Wi-Fi sign-offs and yeah. Electric mm. Dragon and Shelleys and all of that is that the more of those you start adding to your home, the more impact that's having on your network. And yep. now you're going to have to move, as I've done recently, to a platform that allows you to run supports VLANs, you know, mm-hmm. and now you're, now you're in a whole other space. Cause, and, and particularly you know, even just for privacy, right? Yeah. Anything that connects to your yeah. Wi-Fi. Yep. Well, we Phil, yeah. Phil and I have talked about this quite a few yeah. times about, you know, the security aspect of it too. I, I'm very anti-Wi-Fi when it comes to smart home stuff. Just as much as I can avoid. I, I know it's easier for the consumer, um, but I don't know. I just, it always irks me that there's something spying on my network or that I'm beholden to some person's cloud, yeah. like for example, Wemo or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, well, I've I've got Unify gear now, so I've I've set that all up with three access points, and I've followed mm. a few blogs and and um got the VLAN yes. set up with the firewall rules, and I'm all happy with that. So and and that's another thing of going Wi-Fi, right? Like you've had to upgrade your Wi-Fi because obviously the more devices you add to your network, the slower it gets. And now to get to the state you're at, I'm guessing it's not a cheap experience to have to upgrade uh, to. Well, such no, a- I. I- I went from having one Synology router yep. slash access point as my whole <laughs> Wi-Fi to two thousand yeah. dollars worth of ubiquity yeah. gear. So I've got yeah. five network switches, <laughs> wow. controller, and three access points now. So yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's 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 got a bit hairy and scary. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 again, it's one of those things, right? As as you grow as well, you end up needing more stuff and blah blah blah. It's just it's it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. But all my other gear is I'm using a combination of Zigbee and Z-Wave and Wi-Fi. So I've got about 35 Zigbee devices. Um, I think I've got about 50 Wi-Fi devices and about seven Z-Waves. So, and my Z-Wave, I hear people complaining nice. about that, yeah. but my Z-Wave has been rock solid, absolutely rock solid, never caused an issue. As long as you've got powered devices to act as routers, then should be fine yeah 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 and i've got wall switches that do that and i've got a yale z-wave door lock and uh, yeah actually that's a couple of things i was going to talk about like my best purchases that would be my two best purchases would be the yale door lock and the integration to my alarm panel which is the invisalink yeah. invisalink mm-hmm. module that goes into a dsc alarm panel and i think for, for anyone doing home automation um if you've got an alarm system in your house I mean, obviously, there's a benefit to having an alarm in the first place. Integrating your alarm system into Home Assistant should be a, a, an absolute first step. Absolutely. You get automatic yeah. presence detection. So if you've got a motion sensor in a room, now you've got a smart room detector. And you can base, as I do, all of my automations are based on the status of my alarm panel. So Same. why do I need to know who's home and who's not home with convoluted presence detection when if the alarm is set, no one is home. It's that simple. So I get a bunch of things happen when the alarm is set and another bunch of things happen when the alarm is unset. It's pretty straightforward. And it's guest and um, Mm. other user-friendly, right? As long as no one knows the code, it acts the same no matter who it is. Well, the nice thing with the the Yale Z-Wave, or the Yale lock I've got can take a Z-Wave or a Zigbee module, but the Zigbee wasn't available when I purchased it. But um, you can have Mm. uh, user codes in the door lock that are filled into slots. Yeah. So when you add a user code, it's either in slot one or slot two or slot three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we have people um, look after the house, if we go away, we have house sitters in. Well, a house sitter has got her own code and her code is in slot seven, say. Well, Home Assistant knows that the code right. is used in slot seven. So I can detect that that slot was used to unlock the door by a valid user. 
So now a guest mode can be automatically initiated yeah, yeah. by someone putting their code into the door lock. So, yeah, and vice versa. When So when she leaves on the last day and we come home and either my son or my wife or myself mm-hmm. enter yeah. our door code, then Home Assistant comes out of guest mode because mm. it knows that one of the real owners is back. So, yeah, can't recommend a uh, um, home automation door lock or an alarm integration strongly enough. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really nice. Mm. Um, yeah, and the other couple of cool things I've got is my Hick Vision cameras. Um, the reason why I bought those is because there's a, a native integration into Home Assistant. Yep. So you can have... The hex vision cameras, like a lot of them now, actually allow you to have an object detection or a wire cross set up in the camera. So <clears throat> I've got an object detection zone set up at my front door. So when we've got a doorbell, which is, of course, wired into Home Assistant, but what I yeah. found is that only probably 30 or 40% of people yeah. actually push my doorbell. I'd rather knock on the window. Heaps yeah. of them just knock on the door. So what I have with my uh, outdoor hick vision cameras, I've got an object detection zone, and when someone steps inside of that yeah. for one second, then it notifies Home Assistant that there's someone standing at the front door, uh, even though they haven't pushed the doorbell. And that works flawlessly. And that's a native integration with hick vision and Home Assistant turns up as a binary sensor. And and is the... Is the detection like is it like a intelligent or is it just object so like again if it's let's say there's a cat that ends up standing on there for um, like over a second whatever does that still trip it up or does it look for a human uh no it's 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 semi-smart and mm. when you set up the object detection you draw the zone that you want the object to be in um and then you can tell it how long that you want that yeah, they yeah, need yeah. to be in that zone for. So I've got mine just set to one second, but you could have it, say, 10 seconds. Oh. Yeah, so you've got minimum and maximum object size. So um, okay, yeah, that works really well. And then one thing, I don't know whether a lot of people know this or not, but when you've got an IP camera, you can actually typically set up multiple streams. So you can have a, a high-definition stream recording to your, your NAS or whatever you record to, and then you can have a secondary stream which is what I use. I have, a, I have a very low quality stream, which actually goes and I use that for cast and home assistant. Mm-hmm. So when the object detection goes off or the doorbell is pushed, I have my small TV in my family room turns on automatically. Mm-hmm. And then I use the cast to cast the video from the second stream on right. the camera, which is a, um, a low bit rate um h264 stream because home assistant doesn't like h265 yep yep um but you I should think the android app now supports h265. yeah i saw that this morning yeah. so you should be using h265 on your main stream yeah. and have that you know high resolution and say 8 10 12 frames per second but i send a i think it's a 720p stream at three frames per second but medium quality h264 i cast to my chromecast connected to my tv okay and right. then, so it turns the tv on turns it to the chromecast and put cast the camera from the front door and then it waits 30 or 40 seconds and then turns off and yeah it's actually quite an extensive automation but and some lights flash and a few other things happen but yeah it works Works really well. Does, does the motion uh, or the object detection, does that require um, the cloud or any, or is it all done no, locally on the device? No, it's all done locally. So wow. it's, uh, yeah, it sends something across your network that Home Assistant picks up as a binary sensor to say that, that that's activated. So, and you've got wire cross too, but you need a specific um, field of view for wire cross to be effective. Right. So object yeah. detection works a lot better. So yeah, I, ca- I can't recommend that highly enough because you can buy, you can buy a, an outdoor dome camera with that functionality now for about $90. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Very yeah. reasonably priced. Yeah. POE power. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that's, that's why I bought the Hick Vision one because it had the, the binary sensor integrated. Which is awesome. You don't have mm. to run it through any other like TensorFlow or this or that or anything like that. It just kind of does most of it no. itself, which which is awesome. No, I, I don't like don't like to be things to be overly yeah. complicated because yeah, it just it just turns into completely crazy. agreed. Completely agreed. <laughs> the big thing for me with Home Assistant is actually the the community. That's really what's made it so powerful because 
if I've got, as I said, I'm not a coder. Yeah. Yeah. But if, if I've got a templating issue, which is my, those are most of my issues around templates, because that stuff is just freaking rocket science. And, um, <laughs> I'll just put something up on the Home Assistant forum and say, look, this is what I'm trying to do. You know, I've had a go. How can I help? And I've done this on other forums years ago, and the response was always, go and read the manual yeah, because you won't learn unless you do it yourself. Yeah, But that's not the way on Home Assistant forum. Some freaking guru ninja will come in with a template <laughs> and go, bang, check this out, you know? Yeah, yeah. And... You go, on, well, I don't even understand what that is, you know, but you put it in and, you know, lo and behold, it works and you, you end up with a bit of a dialogue, you know. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's just, just awesome because you can achieve anything you want just by asking a nice, polite question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's totally. key, right? It's polite, not <laughs> fix this for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, and, it's true. Yeah, I mean, I, I can, yeah, if I post a question at, 8 p.m. at night, you know, when I'm playing around, I, I can normally expect an answer within a couple of oh, yeah. hours, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. No, the the yeah. community is fantastic. I mean, I, I use it all the time. Like I and, and usually most of my problems have already been solved on there, so I don't post too often. <laughs> I just read through something that somebody else found earlier, and then which is great, right? It's a really good uh, good knowledge base as well. So, uh, Well, if I added up all the time that I'm spent searching the Home Assistant forums, yeah, I've <laughs> probably lost six months off my life, I would say. <laughs> in a good way. Dear, yeah. oh, dear. Yeah, yeah, in a good way, yeah. Yeah, it's an obsession, that's for sure. Well, Pete, I think we could talk to your ear off for, for days, but I think we're going to have to, to wrap it there. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking about all your cool stuff. As I said, I swear your house must be like Wallace and Gromit's house. Yeah. There's <laughs> a reason why you've got a guest mode to make sure that when they wake up, they don't get their pants put on for them. That's right. Correct, um, correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. No, thanks for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. See you later. If you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rohan Karamandi. For links to topics that we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io.